أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم هل أتى على الإنسان هين من الدحر لم يكن شيئا مذكورا إِنَّا خَلَقْنَا الْإِنْسَانَ مِنْ نُطْفَةٍ أَمْسَاجٍ نَبَتَ لِيهِ فَجَعَلْنَاهُ سَمِيئًا بَصِيرًا إِنَّا هَدَيْنَاهُ السَّبِيلَ إِمَّا سَاكِرًا وَإِمَّا كَفُورًا إنا أعتنا للكافرين سلاسل وعلالا وصيرا إن الأبرار يسربون من كأس كان مزاجها كافورا أين يصرب بها عباد الله يفجرونها تفجرون خاف من ربنا يعمل بوسا قطريرا فوقاهم الله صر ذلك اليوم وعطاهم نظرة وصرورا وجزاهم بما صبروا جنة وحريرا متكين فيها على العرائك لا يعون فيها سمسا ولا زمحريرا ودانية عليهم قلالها وظلنا قطوفها تدليلا ويطاف عليهم بآنية من فطة وأكواب كانت قواريرا قوارير من فطة قطروها تقديرا ويسقون فيها كأسا كان مزاجها زنجبيلا أين فيها تسمى سسبيلا ويطوف عليهم ولدان مخلدون إذا رعيتهم حسبت لهم لؤلؤا ماثورا وإذا رأيت ثم رأيت نعيما وملكا كبيرا آليهم ثياب صندس خبر واستبرق وهلوا أساور من فطة وسقاهم ربهم سرابا طهورا إن هذا كان لكم جزاء وكان سيكم مذكورا إن نخاه من ربنا يعمل بسا تقصيرا واصبر لحكم ربك ولا تطئن منهم آتيا أو كفورا واذكر اسم ربك تبو وسيلا ومن الليل فاشل لهم وسبح ليلا طويلا إن هؤلاء يحبون العاجلة وعذن وراءهم يوما ثقيلا نحن خلقناهم وسدنا أسرهم وإذا شعنا بدلنا أمثالهم تبديلا إن هذه تذكرة فما شاء اتخيل ربه سبيلا وما تشاءون إلا أن يشاء الله إن الله كان عليما حكيما يدخل من يشاء في رحمته والظالمين عاد لهم مذابا عليما
أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليك يا أبا عبد الله السلام عليك يا ابن رسول الله السلام عليك يا ابن أمير المؤمنين وابن سيد الوسيين السلام عليك يا ابن فاطمة سيدة النساء العالمين السلام عليك يا ثار الله وابن ثاره والوتر الموتور السلام عليك وعلى الأرواح التي هلت بفنائك عليكم مني جميعا سلام الله أبدا ما بغيت وبقي الليل والنهار يا أبا عبد الله لقد عظمت الرزية وجلت وعظمت المصيبة بك علينا وعلى جميع أهل الإسلام وجلت وعظمت مصيبتك في السماوات على جميع أهل السماوات فلعن الله أمة أسست أساس الظلم والجور عليكم أهل البيت ولعن الله أمة دفعتكم عن مقامكم وأزالتكم عن عن مراتبكم التي رتبكم الله فيها ولعن الله أمة قتلتكم ولعن الله الممهدين لهم بالتمكين من قتالكم بريت إلى الله وإليكم منهم ومن أشياهم وأتباعهم وأوليائهم يا أبا عبد الله إني سلم لمن سلمكم وحرب لمن هاربكم إلى يوم القيامة ولعن الله آل زياد وآل مروان ولعن الله بني أمية غاطبة ولعن الله بن مرجانة ولعن الله عمر بن سعد ولعن الله شمرا ولعن الله أمة أسرجات وألجمات وتنقبات لقتالك بأبي أنت وأمي لقد عظم مصابي بك فأسأل الله الذي أكرم مقامك وأكرمني بك أن يرزقني طلب ثارك مع إمام منصور من أهل بيت محمد صلى الله عليه وآله اللهم اجعلني عندك وجيها بالحسين عليه السلام في الدنيا والآخرة يا أبا عبد الله إني أتغرب إلى الله وإلى رسوله وإلى أمير المؤمنين وإلى فاطمة وإلى الحسن وإليك بموالاتك وبالبراءة ممن قاتلك ونسب لك الحرب وبالبراءة ممن أسس أساس الظلم والجور عليكم وأبرأ إلى الله وإلى رسوله ممن أسس أساس ذلك وبنى عليه بنيانا وجرى في ظلمه وجوره عليكم وعلى شيعكم بريت إلى الله وإليكم منهم وتغرب إلى الله ثم إليكم بموالاتكم وموالات وليكم وبالبراءة من أعدائكم والناصبين لكم الحرب وبالبراءة من أشياعهم وأتباعهم إني سلم لمن سالمكم وحرب لمن حاربكم وولي لمن وانكم وعدو لمن عاداكم فأسأل الله الذي أكرمني بمعرفتكم ومعرفة أوليائكم ورزقني البراءة من أعدائكم أن يجعلني معكم في الدنيا والآخرة وأن ثبت لي عندكم قدم صدق في الدنيا والآخرة وأسأله أن يبلغني المقام المحمود لكم عند الله وأن يرزقني طلب ثاري مع إمام حدا ظاهر راتق بالحق منكم وأسأل الله بحقكم وبالشأن الذي لكم عنده أن يعطيني بمصابي بكم أفضل ما يعطي مصابا بمصيبته 
مصيبة ما أعظمها وأعظم رزيتها في الإسلام وفي جميع السماوات والأرض اللهم اجعلني في مقامي هذا ممن تناله منك صلوات ورحمة ومغفرة اللهم اجعل محياي محيا محمد وآل محمد ومماتي ممات محمد وآل محمد اللهم إن هذا يوم تبركت به بنو ميا وابن واكلة الأكباد اللعين بن اللعين على لسانك ولسان نبيك صلى الله عليه وآله في كل موطن وموغف وغف فيه نبيك صلى الله عليه وآله اللهم لعن أبا سفيان ومعاوية ويزيد بن معاوية عليهم منك اللعنة أبد الآبدين وهذا يوم فرحت به آل زياد وآل مروان بقتلهم الحسين صلوات الله عليه اللهم فضعف عليهم اللعن منك والعذاب الأليم اللهم إني يتغرب إليك في هذا اليوم وفي موغفي هذا وأيام حياتي بالبراءة منهم واللعنة عليهم وبالموالاة لنبيك وآل نبيك عليهم وعليهم السلام اللهم لعن أول ظالم ظلم حق محمد وآل محمد وآخر تابع له على ذلك اللهم لعن العصابة التي جاحدت الحسين وشايعت وبايعت وتابعت على قتله اللهم لعنهم جميعا السلام عليك يا أبا عبد الله وعلى الأرواح التي حلت بفنائك عليك مني سلام الله أبدا ما بقيت وبقي الليل والنهار ولا جعله الله آخر الأحد مني لزيارتكم السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين اللهم خص أنت أول ظالم باللعن مني وابدأ به أولا ثم لعن الثاني والثالث والراقب والرابع اللهم لعن يزيد خامسا ولعن عبيد الله بن زياد وابن مرجانة وعمر بن سعد والشمرة وآل أبي سفيان وآل زياد وآل مروان إلى يوم القيامة اللهم لك الحمد وحمد الشاكرين لك على مصابهم الحمد لله على عظيم رزيتي اللهم ارزقني شفاعة الحسين يوم الورود ثبت لي قدم صدغا عندك مع الحسين وأصحاب الحسين الذين بذلوا محجهم دون الحسين عليه السلام صلوا على محمد وآل محمد Let us all welcome Sheikh Salim Bimji with three of your lodges of salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad
اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم الحمد للہ رب العالمین الحمد للہ الذی ہدانا لہذا و ما کنا لنہتدی لولا ان ہدان اللہ والصلاة والسلام على اشرف الانبیاء و سید المرسلین و شفی المذنبین سیدنا و نبینا و حبیب قلوبنا و طبیب نفوسنا و شفی ذنوبنا اب القاسم محمد اللہم صلی علی محمد و آل محمد والصلاة والسلام على اہل بیته الطیبین الطاہرین المعصومین المذلومین المنتجبین لا سیما بقیت اللہ امام الحجت الثانی الاشر روحی و ارواح العالمین له الفداح و عجل اللہ تعالی فرجه الشریف و لعنت دائمت على اعدائهم الالان الى قیام یوم الدین اما بعد رب شرح لی صدری و یسر لی امری و حل الاقدت من لسانی یفقه قولی For the hastening of the return of our 12th Imam, Imam Al-Hujjah, one salawat upon Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. We continue in our series for this blessed month of Ramadan, this blessed month of Muharram, this tragic month of Muharram, this month where we remember the tragedy of Karbala, but at the same time remember the victory of truth over falsehood. We remember that the supreme sacrifice given by Imam Hussein alayhi salam on the day of Ashura along with that of his family and friends solidified and it gave a rebirth to the religion of Islam that had been left dormant after the death of the Messenger of Allah. As we go on in tonight's lecture, the second in this series, I want to just do a brief refresher of what we mentioned last night. We began with this reminder that the month of Muharram should be a month where we begin to reconnect to the Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon all of them, and especially Abu Abdullah alayhi salam and his mission. We mentioned that just as in the month of Ramadan, we reconnect to the Quran by the recitation of the Quran on a daily basis, that the month of Muharram and obviously the month of Safar, that these two months combined give us the ideal opportunity to reconnect to Karbala, to Abu Abdullah, to all of the symbols and all of those uh, individuals and events that have given life to Islam and have given us the identity that we have today. We began with two verses of the Quran from chapter 14, as you will recall, from Surah Ibrahim, verses 24 and 25. And in that verse 24, Allah gave us the parable, the mathal, of what He called this kalimatan tayyiba, this pure word. And Allah said that the pure word is like a pure tree. Where he said, Asluha thabitun wa faruha sama." And we went on to say that these majalis that we hold, that we have been holding for a thousand if not more years, become the epitome of this verse. That these majalis, these gatherings, these commemorative sessions that we have where we remember the tragedy of Karbala, they are the epitome of the pure word. They get us closer to Allah. They get us closer to the Messenger of Allah. And as we mentioned that these uh, pure words that are from the Ahlul Bayt are from the Qur'an, just as the pure tree that Allah gave us the symbolism of, the parable of, they allow us to grow, to mature, to develop, to recognize that even when we are in difficult situations, that we have the ability to go back to the tragedy of Karbala, to analyze the various events that have taken place in that holy land and to root ourselves and to ground ourselves in the remembrance of that tragedy of Karbala. From there we went on to begin the topic of this pure life, this Islamic life. We looked at the verse from Surat Al-Anfal chapter number 8 where Allah addresses the believers and He said, O you who believe, istajibu lillahi wa li rasuli idha da'akum Lima yuhyikum. Answer the call of Allah and His Messenger when they call you to that which gives you life. And we mentioned the fact that you and I are all alive right now physically. There are 8 billion people on earth right now that are physically alive. But Allah differentiates between physical life and spiritual life. There are billions of people alive today. Physically walking, breathing, eating, drinking, talking, doing the mundane activities that we all go through in life. But the Quran does not 
define them as being alive in the way that Allah does in this verse. This true life, this pure life, this Islamic life, it comes when, as Allah said, when we answer the call of Allah and the call of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. And once we pick up the Qur'an, once we pick up the books of the ahadith that we obviously have access to in our language, once we begin to delve into the teachings of Islam, when we get to that stage, we begin to travel down that path of becoming alive, really manifesting the life that Allah wants us to lead. And that life will not only carry us in this world, that life that we get from following the orders of Allah, from following the messenger, from following the rightful successors of the Prophet, namely the Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon all of them, that will give us a life in the world to come in the Akhirat, which is what we all crave and what we all are hopefully looking for. Tonight, as we continue in this series, I want to take our uh, minds and our discussion to the next level and look at a topic which is really the foundational block of this religion of Islam. And that is about Tawheed, the, what we would very, very roughly translate as monotheism, the oneness of God. You know, if you ask anybody, even a non-Muslim for example, hopefully they would know the minimal about Islam. And if you were to ask them what is the minimal uh, basis that the religion is founded on, they would say, well, you are part of the Abrahamic family. You believe in one God. Uh, you know, Allah is your God, as they would say. And yes, they would be right. But the question which we want to look at today and answer is that what is the definition of Tawheed? What is monotheism? Again, as a very rough translation of it. We all claim to be muwahids, ones who believe in the oneness of God. But how deep have we taken the concept of Tawheed? How far have we allowed this to permeate our lives? How far have we allowed the Tawheed which is explained by the Qur'an, which has been explained by the Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them, and that has been explained by our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam into our lives. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. One of the first things that we have to ask ourselves and our people would be asking is that what is the goal of this life? Were we born, as the Quran says, that there are some people who say we were born, we live, we die, and that's all there is? Is that all there is to the life of this world? Is that just we're here for a couple of years to enjoy ourselves, to go through the motions, and then we end and then there is nothing that comes after this world? What happens when we are faced with difficulties and challenges in our lives? For those who don't believe in a, in a supreme being, in a higher being, in a God, what happens when they are faced with challenges? Where do they go? Where do they turn? Where do we turn? And even maybe worse than that is, if this life is all about attaining stuff, Material, material things, what happens when we reach and we get to that level of making it in this world, when we have everything that we hoped to get? Then what happens with the life? What is the meaning of life? What is the purpose of life? You know, I remember a story, and this is a true story, it happened to me about 20 years ago. I met a man from our community, the followers of the Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them. But his religious affiliation was very, I would say, superficial. I don't mean to cast doubt on his Iman, but just the way that him and I spoke and interacted, it seemed that his connection to Islam was at a very superficial level. It was just a basic understanding of God. And it's not his fault he was perhaps not brought up in a community or an opportunity to learn further about religion. So although he was Muslim by name, he was Muslim by appearance, we could say, but he didn't really have a deep understanding of life. For him, life was money. And he happened to be not only a millionaire, but he was a multimillionaire. Many times over owning properties around the world, 
in exotic destinations, traveling the world in first class on airlines. He had it made from the materialistic point of view. But he shared with me a story that has resonated with me for the last 20 years that I want to share with you. Because this was his realization of this life as well. And he told me, he says that, you know, I'm a multimillionaire, I can travel around the world. He says, but I realized how my money does not define me or grant me happiness in this life, that it is something different. So I asked him, what's the story? So he says that, and this is back in around 2002, he is, or he was an avid fan of soccer, watching the FIFA games and the World Cup, and he enjoyed watching soccer games. And he says that in 2000, 2002, whenever that World Cup happened, and I think it was in Asia somewhere, he says that he wanted to fly and watch that game in person. He had the money. He had all of the means at his disposal to hop on a plane first class and go to Japan or wherever the games were being held, the FIFA World Cup, and watch the game in person. But then he sat and he was looking at his entire empire, his businesses, the employees under him, all the money that was coming in. And he says, I realized that I couldn't leave my business. This is obviously in the early 2000s. The internet wasn't as powerful as it is today. He didn't have cloud computing and all of this. So he was literally tied to his office in this, uh, wherever he worked. So he says, I tried the best that I could to kind of get away for a week or even a weekend to see the games. And he says, I couldn't do it. So no problem. Next best thing is watch it on pay-per-view, right? So he's watching the game, and he's telling me, he says, that he had a friend in that same country who's an average income earner making maybe 40, 50,000 a year, doesn't have, you know, a, a nice big house, can't afford to fly first class, simple guy, simple lifestyle. And he says that as the camera was, uh, you know, showing that game, that soccer game, and it's panning the audience as the cameras usually do, the camera was going through the audience and it stopped on a person. And it stopped on his friend, just by chance, as we say. But we know that this world doesn't run on chance, right? It runs by Allah's mechanism. The camera is panning, it stops on his friend. He's watching it on the big screen in his office or at home and he sees his friend there making 40, 50,000 a year and he's at that game in person enjoying his money, his little money that he makes. And then he says to me, it dawned on me at that moment that this money isn't everything. I have millions that I could spend, but I can't enjoy my life. I'm stuck in an office watching the game on television. And there is my friend making just an average income of 40, 50,000 a year. And yet he's in the stadium watching the game live. And he told me, he said, that's when I realized that life is not all about money. Right? That there is something greater in life than just stuff, making money, getting ahead in life, you know, being a workaholic. That story, as a real life story, has stuck with me for 20 years because really in that one lesson that he learned and that he shared with me and that I've shared with you, it shows us that life is not just about these things because as I said, once you make it, then what do you do, Right? Even worse than losing everything is getting to, a uh, getting to a position in life because now what meaning does your ha life have? You've made it in this world, so to speak. And so we recognize from this, brothers and sisters, that there is something greater in life than just this material world. There is something which needs to drive us to give us purpose why we wake up every morning, why we go to school, why we go to work, why we do what we do. And that thing is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, our creator. You know, tonight in this discussion about Tawheed, I want to try and look at it from a different perspective. But you know, when you look at the Qur'an, you see that Allah has devoted at least one-third of the Qur'an to Him, to Him alone. You, know, you look at the Qur'an, there are roughly 6,200 and 36 ayat, give or take. Scholars differ on the exact number of verses because some will not count the repetitive verses that are repeated in word. 
Some will not count the bismillah. Some will, you know, uh, count in different ways, but more or less around 6,300 verses. One third of the Quran is about the day of judgment, the end of this world. So one third is just about Yawm al Qiyamah. There are other ayat about ahkam, about the jurisprudence, anywhere from 300 to 500 verses on praying, fasting, hajj, zakat, khums, marriage, divorce, and so on and so forth. Only 300 verses or 500, that's a small amount. Are there stories of the past prophets? But one third of the Quran is about God, about Allah. Right? For us to be able to recognize to the limits of our God-given ability who God is, we will never get to a true understanding of God, of what He truly is, because our minds cannot comprehend and fathom that. But Allah has done His level best in the Qur'an to give us a clear explanation of who He is and also who He isn't. You know, and so one of the famous verses of the Qur'an, which I'll begin with, is from Surah Al-Ikhlas, the chapter of sincerity. And I'm sure we've all memorized this because it is one that we read in our salat every day, I'm sure. It's highly recommended to recite this chapter every day in our prayers. In fact, the hadith of the Prophet and Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them, tell us that if you go one day praying your five daily prayers, your Fajr, Dhuhr, Asr, Maghrib, and Isha, and you don't recite Surah Al-Ikhlas, you have basically not been fair to Allah. You've not been fair to the Qur'an. Hadith say you are not counted as being amongst the musallin, as those who engage in salat. So at least once in one of your five daily prayers, Surah Al-Ikhlas should be there. It's also mentioned in the hadith that it is equivalent to one-third of the Qur'an. And scholars suppose that maybe this is the fact because as I said, one-third of the Qur'an is about Tawheed. And so this chapter is worth one-third of the Qur'an because it is all about the oneness of Allah. The very first verse after the Bismillah is, Kul hu Allahu ahad. Where Allah tells Rasulullah, our beloved Prophet Muhammad, Sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. He says to the Prophet, say to the people, say that he is God the one, that he is Allah the one, Ahad. You know, now even this word, Ahad, there is such a debate amongst the theologians and the philosophers of, of Islam that what does it mean, Ahad? If you look at commentators such as Ayatollah Nasir Makaram in his Tafsir Namuna, he goes through about four or five pages just looking at the word Ahad, does it differ from Wahid in Arabic? Because both are translated as one. Is Ahad, what, what does it mean? He quotes a hadith from many Imams to look at the definition of Ahad. Is it the same as one in terms of a numerical sense or is it something different? I won't go into all the specifics. But basically this verse in itself, although it's only four words, Kul huwa Allahu and Ahad, but scholars have written maybe not volumes but tens of pages on what does each and every word in this verse mean. In fact, even um, some of our ulama have taken the word huwa, kul huwa Allahu Ahad, the ha and the wow, and have gone into explaining what does the ha mean, what does the wow mean, how do these two letters go back to the oneness of Allah. So it's not as easy as saying, say God, he, say that He is God, the One. It's a much deeper discussion. And obviously tonight we will just scratch the surface of the Tawheed of Allah. But as I said, that life is not just about a race to have more stuff, to get to you know, uh, the end of life with the most things. It's not as this material world we live in tells us that the person with the most toys at the end wins the game. No, it's something deeper than that, brothers and sisters. We know from the Quranic perspective and even from our intellect, if we sit and, re and reflect on the ayat, that we weren't created worthless or for no purpose. Allah tells us so many times in the Quran this realization. He says, 
Do people think that they were created abath with no goal, with no purpose, and that we would not go back to God? No, we weren't created worthless with no aim. Allah had a reason why he created us. We have a reason why we are on earth, why we're here. We all have a purpose. We have a role to serve, whether it's now, whether it's later on. We know even if you take it further to the time of our 12th Imam and his return, we've all heard the number 313 of the 313 people that will be there with the 12th Imam. But do we know that 50 of them will be women? So it's not only men that have a role in the time of the Imam that we have nothing to do, just men will be responsible for running the affairs and, and helping the 12th Imam, but 50 will be women. That means that women have a role to play in this religion, in the society, in our community. They have a direct role in the 12th Imam's revolution. Now what is that role? Obviously I don't want to go into that tonight. Maybe a latter night we might touch upon it. But it shows us that we don't have, you know, we're not here just to do anything or nothing or just have fun and go on with life. That we have a purpose and that purpose ultimately should be Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But at the same time that we are created for a purpose, and that is to know Allah, to reach to Allah in, the terms, of, in terms of spirituality, of getting to Allah, getting to know Allah, we also recognize at the same time that we have a moral duty while we're on earth. We're not just here to become monastic hermits and you know, move up into the mountains and into a cave and worship God as some people within the Muslim world think that this is religiosity. You know, people think, well, I won't get married, I'll be spiritual. Because why should I pollute myself and have a spouse and have children and get involved in the dunya, that this will detract me from God? No, we're not like the Christian church that taught that marriage is the lesser of two evils. You know, if you have a choice between marriage and sinning, it's better to get married. No, Islam doesn't look at it like that. Islam looks at marriage as being a way to get to Allah. Having families is a way to get to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Having a job is a way to get to Allah. Playing sports is a way to get to Allah. In fact, we have the hadith from the Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them, where they tell us, it starts off saying, Laysa minna, that you are not from us. If you leave this dunya, you leave the world and only focus on the world to come. Nor if you only focus on the world to come and leave aside the material world. So there has to be a balance. And Allah recognizes this and He tells us that true tawheed is when you lead that balanced life, you focus on Allah, on religious responsibilities, and also on the societal responsibilities that you have. So coming to Tawheed, and again what we roughly translate as monotheism, what is this? You know, we traditionally would translate and teach our children in the Sunday school or in the Islamic schooling system that Tawheed means monotheism. It means to believe in one God. It means to deny the fact or deny the belief of others that there are two gods because some people believe in a god of good and a god of evil. Right? There's a duality in God in some religions. Others believe in the Trinity, God the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. So sometimes when we learn and we are taught Tawheed and we think about it, we think, oh, God is one, Allah Ahad. It means there's no two or three gods. And we move on with life. We don't recognize that, although that is an accurate definition at one level, but it's not the complete definition of what Allah means when He talks about Tawheed. Rather, Tawheed can be understood as proclaiming the oneness of God first and foremost, maintaining this, and practicing it in our lives. Recognizing that Allah is the only one in existence, and that everything that we do needs to be geared and focused towards that one creator. You know, it's a very a simple example that I can probably give is when you watch the news or the television or you watch the internet, they talk about healthy living. 
They'll say that to you know, be healthy, you have to eat well. You have to have a balanced diet. You have to have a good exercise regimen in your life to remain healthy. Now, it's one thing for you and I to see those commercials and just believe in it. Yeah, I believe in, in healthy living. But then you're eating the fried chicken and you're eating the greasy food and you're not exercising and you're not taking care. You're not eating you know, the vitamins and minerals you need. So that belief in eating good and in physical exercise won't get you anywhere. It's just a belief. I believe it. I saw the TV commercial. My doctor told me don't eat too much you know, uh, sugary foods. Keep away from diabetes. Don't do this. Don't do that. I believe them. But I don't practice it. What's the value of that belief? It's very minimal, if any. But what has value is when the doctor tells you to do this or don't do this, and then you follow it. You follow the regimen of eating healthy, of exercise, of you know, doing all of the things that we're recommended to do, not only by our doctors, but in the hadith of the Prophet and the Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them. So the belief system is one, and the practice is something different. And this is where we see Tawheed, brothers and sisters, that at the theoretical perspective or theoretical aspect, Yes, is to say there's only one God. La ilaha illallah. There is no God, nothing worthy of worship, nothing that is deserving of our adoration except for the one true God. But then to take it further is where we have to get to, where we have to move forward, which is to believe it. And not only to believe it, but to ensure that every action that we perform, it becomes a part and parcel integrated with Tawheed. So akhlaq in Tawheed. It's not only a name of a book that our scholars have written, but akhlaq, when I look at akhlaq in the mirror of Tawheed, of the oneness of God, my morality shouldn't just be to be a good person because it's financially beneficial to me. right? That I go to work and I serve customers and I'm nice to them because... It'll be good for the end, you know, for the bottom line. They'll buy more. They'll become a better customer. No, I become a good person because God wants me to be it. Out of monotheism, because these are qualities that God wants us to imbibe. Whether it be acts of worship, whether it be morality, the akhlaq of Islam, whether it be the jurisprudence, the ahkam, the fiqh, all of these areas, once we begin to look at them under the lens of tawheed, then we begin to develop what other scholars have referred to as a Tawheedi lifestyle, where our entire life becomes centered on Allah. That we do whatever we do for the sake of Allah, because Allah wants us to do it. Or Allah wants us not to do something. Not because it's not, you know, it's, it's a good thing to do from a financial perspective or from another perspective. No, but because Allah expects it from us, that we want to channel our entire life to be on the path of Tawheed, on the path of following Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. You know, this theory of Tawheed, which we have to again internalize and, and manifest it, it's probably best seen in our teachings given to us by the Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them, in the du'as that we recite. You know, one of the tragedies of our, of our era and many of our communities, especially when we don't understand the language of the du'as, the Arabic of the Imams, peace be upon them, is we read these du'as, but we only read them to get to the end of the du'a. You know, how many communities I've been to that don't understand a word of Arabic but yet Thursday night comes and we recite Dua Kumail. Now I'm not doubting on the power of Dua Kumail in Arabic. I'm not saying we don't read it, but I'm saying that if we don't understand the language, A, we have to begin to teach and learn the Arabic of the, of the Quran, of the Duas. And while we're on that path of trying to learn the Arabic of the Imams, how they communicated to Allah, we need to begin to learn to read these du'as in a language we can understand. Or at least to have, let's say, a PowerPoint presentation with translations that we can read as the Arabic is going on.
Because I, I guarantee you, brothers and sisters, that the du'as of Ahlul Bayt salam, were we to understand them, we would have a radically different understanding of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because this is all the du'as are about. The du'as that the Imams taught and even what the Prophet taught are never about themselves. You look at Dua Kumail, a masterpiece. Where do you see Imam Ali talking about himself in the du'a? He doesn't talk about himself at all. He doesn't even talk about the Prophet in the du'a. Yes, at the very end we send salawat on the Prophet because that is a recommendation in the, in the, in the du'a to bless, ask Allah to bless the Prophet. But from beginning to end, Imam Ali is only communicating with Allah and getting you and I to recognize the oneness of Allah within the du'a. You know, there's this portion, let me just mention it as I move on, where Imam says, As'aluka bihaqqika wa qudsik. I ask you, O Allah, by the right that you have and by your greatness, by your sanctity, by your honor, by your majesty. And by the greatness of your characteristics, your qualities, your traits, and your names. He says, He's saying to Allah, Allow my entire 24 hours, day and night, layl wa nahar, to be filled by your remembrance. That's Tawheed, that my entire day should be in remembrance. But let me ask you, does the Imam, is he saying that I take my prayer beads out and I'm at work and I'm counting, subhanAllah, subhanAllah, subhanAllah. I'm driving in my car and I'm taking out the prayer beads and doing the dhikr of Allah. Is this what the Imam means, that my day and night is in a constant remembrance of Allah? By these little prayer beads that I that I you know buy when I go for ziyara, no, he's not saying that. Yes, that is one manifestation of the dhikr of Allah is to take out the prayer beads and and enumerate the names of God. But more importantly, as Hadith tell us, is when we recognize that every instant of our lives, Allah is watching over us. That the Imams tell us is the greatest dhikr of Allah. When I recognize that when I'm at school, I could be cheating on an exam, but I remember that Allah is ever present. Alam ya'lam bi anna Allah yara, as the Quran says, do we not know that Allah is ever watchful? That I don't cheat on my exam at school because I know Allah is witnessing it. I go to work and I have a customer and I, I'm charging him, I'm billing him by the hour. Do I bill him for eight hours when I only did five hours of work and say, ah, it's okay? He's not going to know the difference? No, I remember that Allah is ever witness. I do the dhikr of Allah and I remember that Allah is witnessing. Why should I steal somebody's money for a few dollars extra? I take in haram income into my life or I work at a company and I get half an hour break for lunch. And I say, you know what? I have to pray Dhuhr and Asr and eat. So I'm going to take an hour. And it's okay. It's a multinational. They're a big company. What's a half an hour to a big company like that? Or I take pens and paper. Or I take a laptop and I don't return it back to work again. And say, well, they're a kafir. They're non-believers. I can do what I want. Right? No, at that stage, I do the dhikr of Allah. And I say, Allah, I remember Allah. And I think, would Allah approve of this? Is this a manifestation of Tawheed? Is this what Allah would expect? And I don't re rip off my customers. I don't rip off my manager or the company I work for. Because I'm engaging, as Imam Ali says, tajala awqati fil wa nahari bi dhikrika ma'mura. I'm constantly in the dhikr of Allah, day and night. So I'm not going to steal or shortchange my customers or take from the companies whatever they have. Again, it's all about Allah and Dua Kumail. And then he says, Wa bi mausula. Allow me to be joined in your service, to always be in the service of Allah. Wa a'mali indaka maqbula, for my actions to be accepted. Hatta takuna a'mali wa awradi kulluha wirdan wahidan wa hali fi khidmatika sarmada. Where he says that allow my life, my works, 
My word, as he says, wirdan wahida, means let every action that I do in my life, not just a word as in a dua that I recite or a dhikr that I make. No, that everything I do from the time I wake up to the time I go to sleep, from the day that I become of age, become baligh, become baligha, I have that, that responsibility to God. Until the day I leave this world, allow me to be in your service and allow me to have, you know, uh, to be on that path, not to deviate from the path of Tawheed. From these few lines of, of Dua Kamil, brothers and sisters, we can see Imam Ali is pointing us to Tawheed. And every line perhaps in the Dua can be looked at under the lens of Tawheed and how we live a monotheistic lifestyle. You know, we get to that point in life, inshallah, we make to that point before we leave this world, before we die, before we're in the ground, that every action that we do is for Allah. Our direction in life becomes Allah. Our direction is not this world or money or power or fame. No, those will come. But the goal and the direction in life becomes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as hadith tell us, that when you and I reform our relationship with Allah, Allah will ensure that our lives are reformed with this world. We serve Allah and this world will serve us. But the hadith tell us, if you serve this dunya, Allah will not allow His walaya, His authority to blanket us. We will be left to the people. We'll be left to the whims of society. We'll be left to the winds of change to blow us this way and that. And God forbid we get to that level where Allah allows us to be left alone to our own inklings and to be devoid of the walaya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Salu ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. There are many other examples of the du'as, but I'm going to skip them for tonight. Other du'as, again, many of our du'as teach us this level of tawheed. All of them, perhaps, I would say, because they all are pointing us back to Allah. But let me go back to the topic and try and wrap up in the next five or so minutes. That one of the reasons why we are expected to not only have the theoretical tawheed, but to make it our world view, that the way that we look at everything around us, that it becomes based on Tawheed, is because of the fact that whatever people do in this world is normally based upon their own motive, their own motivation. Right? The niya, the intention why we people do things. Everybody does things for their own personal reasons. And Allah you know, mentions this in the Quran in chapter 17, Verse number 86 where he says, Kullun ya'malu ala shakilatihi. That everybody does work or stuff based on their own personal reasons. Right? There are those who do things for fame, for their, you know, TikTok moment, to get famous on Instagram, to get famous on social media, people do stuff. There are people who do things even on, you know, in terms of religion. They do things because they think they will get more, you know, likes on social media. They'll get more invitations. You know, people even pray, unfortunately, sometimes, not for Allah, but for others around them. You know, it's like this story that people quote. I don't know if it really happened, but the story says that one day there's a Muslim in the masjid. He walks into the mosque, probably in the Middle East, because they're open all the time. And the man goes in the masjid and he starts to pray, Allahu Akbar, he starts the first surah. And then as he's praying, he hears, he hears some noise behind him. So he thinks to himself in the middle of prayers, oh, somebody's coming to the mosque. Let me kind of show off, you know, and, and recite a longer surah. Make a longer dua in kunut. And so he goes and he makes the longest prayer he's ever prayed. Long surah of the Quran, a long dua in kunut, a long ruku, an ex extra long sajda. He takes a two rakat prayer which would normally take him maybe a minute, a minute and a half. And it's extended to like five or six minutes. He finishes that prayer to see who is behind him. He turns around and a cat walked into the mosque. So he made a beautiful prayer for a cat. Thinking that that was somebody who would be amazed by his prayer. 
So his reward is not with Allah on the Day of Judgment. That cat will have to give him the reward. So people act, people do stuff because of other people, unfortunately. And even people worship other than Allah. I don't mean idol worshippers. I don't mean people that worship in a temple. No, Allah tells us, أَرَأَيْتَ مِنْ اتَّخَذَ إِلَهَهُ هَوَا have you seen those people that take their lower desires, their whims, their passions to be their God? They worship the self. Right? They worship their own egos. Right? Why do people take selfies? You know, up until 15, 16 years ago, there was no word called selfie because we didn't have phones with front-facing cameras. But once those came into being and people started taking selfies, it's because you want to be seen. I want to be seen in the public, you know, on a, on a beach or doing some activity or having fun and showing the world what I'm doing, right? It all became about the self, the nafs, the ego, me. I want to be center stage, the limelight. This verse is so relevant to that concept that it's almost like Allah revealed it for this era, people that would take themselves as being the focal point in society. And ultimately when people get to that level, they begin to forget Allah. And as Allah says in the Quran, He takes it further and He says that when you forget Allah, Allah allows you to forget yourself. Right? You lose direction in life, you lose that life that, that life that Allah and the Messenger call us towards that we talked about last night. And we become people that are the worst of the worst. In fact, there's a hadith I want to share with us. It's narrated from Amir al-Mu'mineen and also it comes to us from the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. And it's a very harsh hadith. You know, but when it comes to speaking truth, the Prophet and Imams, they don't mince their words. If they have to be a bit harsh and forthcoming, and maybe what we might consider as being abrasive or rude, they say it, just as the Qur'an, right? Many times Allah says in the Qur'an that Allah is not scared of the truth, right? Allah is not embarrassed to tell the truth and tell it like it is. Even when the Sahaba, the companions, would come to the house of the Prophet, and they would come and eat food. And they would sit around and chill with the Prophet and chit-chat and talk and waste his time. Allah says in the Quran that the Prophet wants you to leave, but he has too much humility, too much greatness to ask you to leave. But the verse says Allah is not embarrassed and Allah will tell you. Allah will call a spade a spade and tell you, get out of the house of the Prophet, eat. Finish your conversation, then leave. The Prophet has wife, he has got family, he's got things to do. Don't sit there and just, you know, take up his time. So Allah is not scared to tell the truth. So what does the Prophet say? What does Imam Ali say about people that use this world and it becomes their God, their focal point, everything centers around them? The hadith says, Man kana himmatuhu ma yadkhulu batnuhu, batnahu, it's a pretty harsh hadith. He says that that person whose ambitions and endeavors are solely focused on what goes into their stomach, their whole life is about what you eat. You know, you see TV shows on, on, the, on, the, on the channels of master chef and cooking and all of these things to make the food look exactly how it should be. People spend hours prepping food. I'm not saying we don't do that, but we, you know, we eat good food, but going overboard in extremes. The Imam is quoted as saying that that person whose entire focus is what they consume, their worth in life is what comes out at the end. Now you know what comes out at the end. So imagine the Imam is saying that when your entire focus is this dunya and this world, your worth is just what comes out in the toilet. But you don't have any worth. Because your self-worth is now gone. You're only looking at your own passions, your own whims, your own desires. And so in order to wrap up and conclude, we remind ourselves that a true follower on this path of seeking life, istajibu lillahi wa li rasuli idha da'akum 
لِمَا يُحْيِيكُمْ As chapter 8 said, answer the call of Allah and the Messenger when they call you to that which gives you life, is that we need to go back to Tawheed. Not just God is one, and now we're done as, as, as people who believe in Tawheed. No, that we internalize Tawheed. We recognize that not only is there only one God, but everything that we do from the time we wake up till the time we go to sleep, from the time we become mentally aware, we become baligh, we know our responsibilities, until the time we die, whether it's in this center, it's at work, it's at school, it's in the mall, it's in the park, that all of this becomes something and things that we do based on the world outlook of Tawheed, on the oneness of Allah. There's no doubt that we have to study the theoretical aspect and there are great books written by our great scholars that have analyzed Tawheed and given us the in-depth understanding of Tawheed. But once we've understood the theory of Tawheed, that's where we then go to the practical. That now how do I color every day of my life with the color of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? As Allah says in the Quran, Allah. وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ مِنَ اللَّهِ سِبْغَةً That take on the color of Allah. Take on this appearance of Allah. Now Allah doesn't have a color. Allah doesn't have a shape. But what he's saying is سِبْغَةً Allah is take on the qualities of Allah. Take on the characteristics. Become a true follower of Allah. Become one with Allah. Not in a physical sense. Not in a, in a sense of, you know, that we morph with Allah or that we merge into Allah. No, but that we become one with Allah, that our entire lives become patterned on the life that Allah wants us to lead. And that life can be epitomized when we follow the Prophet and his family, the Ahlul Bayt alayhum as salatu was salam, sallu ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. Ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. <clears throat> and tonight as we conclude, continue and we conclude in this night of Muharram, the first official night we've concluded, the first day of Muharram, this is our second majlis. We recognize that we can never get to the status of Rasulullah. It's impossible. You and I will never make it to be like Rasulullah. People say, well, if I can't be like Rasulullah, then what do I do? We know that we can never be like the Ahlul Bayt, alayhum as -salam. No matter how perfect our sister's hijab is, we recognize they will never be as perfect as Fatima Zahra alayhi salam. But may Allah bless them for maintaining the hijab in these difficult situations that we live in. As men, we recognize that we will never have the bravery and chivalry of Amir al-Mu'mineen or even of Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas alayhi salam. We, we might try to get to the level of Hazrat Abbas, but we will never get it there. We could try our entire lives, but we know we won't reach Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas. But we can look at the family of the Prophet, the other members who were not ma'asum, who were not infallible, who were not surrounded by infallibility. And the one man I want to look at tonight as I con in my conclusion is a man who was, although he was, I would say, the first shaheed of Karbala, but he wasn't on the battlefield. He didn't shed a drop of blood in the land of Karbala. And I'm talking about none other than Muslim ibn Aqil, the cousin of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. Muslim ibn Aqil, as we know, was, as I said, the cousin of Imam Hussein, the first cousin. Not only was he a member of the family, but as I said, he didn't have that luxury of being surrounded by Isma. His father, yes, was Aqil the brother of Imam Ali. He had a great status. The Prophet would say, I love Aqil for many reasons. He would foretell that the son of Aqil would help the son of Ali on the day of Ashura. And so the Prophet says, I love Aqil and his family for that reason. But Muslim ibn Aqil, brothers and sisters, was a man like you and I. He wasn't ma'asum. He wasn't infallible. He wasn't given that aura of protection and that level of infallibility. But nonetheless, he was the first shaheed of Karbala. And he was a man that we look up to tonight. You know, when Abu Abdullah salam, was in Mecca, when he left Medina at the end of Rajab in the 60th year after the Hijrah, he moved to Mecca. 
He was in Mecca for Sha'ban, for Ramadan, for Shawwal, for Dhul Qa'dah, and then up until the 9th of Dhul Hijjah. He was receiving emissaries and letters from hundreds, if not thousands, of letters were being delivered to Aba Abdullah. Not only thousands of letters, but these were being signed by entire tribes, entire villages, tens of thousands of Kufans and beyond were saying to Aba Abdullah, Come to Kufa, we need an Imam, we need an Amir. We want you, we pledge our allegiance to you, Ya Hussein. And what did Imam do? He says, I'm not going to go, but I'm going to send somebody as my representative. And who he sends is Muslim ibn Aqil. But he doesn't just send Muslim, he says, go and, and do what you need to do. He writes a letter and in the letter he says, I'm sending you somebody who is my Akhi, my brother. And Ibn Ammi, my cousin, and Thikati, and the trustworthy one, Min Ahli Bayti, from my family. This was a man, brothers and sisters, that Imam Hussein had so much conviction and trust in that he said, You go to Kufa, you gauge the situation, and then you report back. And as we know that Muslim Ibn Aqil made that journey, he loses his travel companions in the desert. But eventually he makes it to the city of Kufa. He makes it to Kufa, but there is already friction stirring in the community. He gets there, he begins to go to the house of Mukhtar, the same Mukhtar that would years later launch a revolution to avenge the tragedy of Karbala. And historians say that, that, that Muslim ibn Aqil will go to the Grand Mosque of Kufa, the same mosque that's there today. He would go to the Masjid of Kufa and there were thousands upon thousands of people praying their Jama'at Namaz behind him day after day. But after the Banu Umayyah found out, once Yazid was told that Muslim is in town and people are following him, people are developing that affinity and they're going to, and they're pledging their allegiance that they will support Aba Abdullah, Yazid sends a letter to replace Nu'man ibn Bashir who was the governor of Kufa at the time with Ubaidullah, Lanatullah Alay. He comes to Kufa and he begins to threaten the people. Historians say that at one time Muslim had thousands of people praying behind him in Jamaat. That he would look behind him after Maghrib and the thousands had trickled down to hundreds. They would do du'as, they would do their dhikrs and he would pray Isha. And he would turn around after Isha and there would be a handful of people in the mosque praying behind him. In this state of loneliness of Ghurba, brothers and sisters, Muslim and Aqil, he walks the streets of Kufa. He has nowhere to go. He knows as the word has gotten out from Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, that if you are found to be a follower of Muslim, if you're found to be a follower of Abu Abdullah, that your head would be on the line. And so the same people that were supporting Muslim now lock their doors. They shut the lights of the house, of their house. They turn off the candles as Muslim walks by. And as Muslim is walking through the streets of Kufa as a stranger, he gets to the house of a woman. It's a woman whose name is, her name is Tawa. She's a lover of the Ahlul Bayt. She's, she notices one evening that there's somebody at her door, sitting at her doorstep. She opens the door, she sees this man. She says to him, oh strange man, who are you? Why are you sitting at my door in the middle of the night? Muslim says, my name is Muslim. I've come from Medina. I'm come, I've come as an emissary from Hussein ibn Ali. As soon as Sawa hears the name of Hussein ibn Ali, she breaks down in tears. She is a lover of the Ahlul Bayt. She recognizes the situation. She tells Muslim that you're not safe to be outside. Come into the house. We're told that Tawa cooks some food for Muslim. She gives Muslim some water. She says that you can stay here, but be careful because her son, she says that my son works for the government. And if he finds out you're in my house, if he finds out that you have been given safe refuge in my house, he will report you to the governor, to Abedullah ibn Ziyad. And as she says that, as Muslim goes to sleep that night, as he wakes up in the morning, the son of Taw'a named Bilal al-Hadrami, he recognizes that Muslim is in the house. He recognizes that his emissary of Abu Abdullah has come into his mother's house immediately because he knows there's a bounty on his head. He goes back to Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad. 
He wants that reward. He wants the money that has been promised. And so he tells them that Muslim ibn Aqil is at the house of my mother. As the historians mentioned that Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad begins to assemble tens upon tens of soldiers. They go towards the house of Tawa. Muslim ibn Aqil not wanting to be a burden on this lady. He leaves the house. He encounters the enemy soldiers. One after one, the historians mention that Muslim fights and he kills them one after the other. Muslim is not an ordinary man. He has the blood of Abu Talib flowing in his veins. He is a warrior. He is a brave, chivalrous man. He fights against the enemies. He cuts them down one after the other. Eventually, however, Muslim is attacked from all sides. They begin to throw rocks at Muslim. They smash his front teeth. They begin to throw rocks at his head. They begin to attack him with spears. Eventually, they they tell Muslim, they say, Muslim, surrender. We promise you that we will give you security and safety with the governor. Muslim accepts this appeal and he goes to the palace of Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad. They begin to curse Muslim ibn Aqil. They begin to curse Aba Abdullah. Muslim recognizes that this is his last moment. These are these last moments of his life. He asks for a glass of water. He tries to drink the water, but the blood is flowing from his mouth. He throws that water out. They fill it again with water. It begins again, the glass begins filled with blood. He throws that water out. For a third time, they give him a glass of water. The teeth that have been broken through the rocks are falling into his glass. He throws the water away. He says, it's okay. I'll be dead in a few moments, I know. And I will go to Rasulullah. I will go to Amir al-Mu'mineen and they will quench my thirst at the pool of Kawthar. Brothers and sisters, as Muslim is going through these difficulties, eventually they make the order to, to kill Muslim. The historians say that they sever Muslim's head from his body as he's on top of the palace on the Darul Imara, the, the palace of Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad. They throw his body from the top of the palace. It lands in the streets of Kufa. They take the body of Muslim ibn Aqil, they drag it through the streets of Kufa. They drag the body of Muslim ibn Aqil. They drag his lifeless corpse through the streets of Kufa, just as they would do with the Ahlul Bayt of the Prophet, just as they would do with Aba Abdullah and his family in a few days after the day of Ashura. Sallallahu alayk Mawla Hussain Sallallahu alayk Mawla Hussain Sallallahu alayk Mawla Hussain Sallallahu alayk Mawla Hussain Oh my master you are the lantern of guidance you are the pride of existence for me you are the lord of patience allah akbar how could they not see all of your virtues O oh son of ali did they not hear what the Prophet has said? I am from him and Hussein is from me. Sallallahu alayk Mawla Hussein. Sallallahu alayk Mawla Hussein. Sallallahu alayk Mawla Hussein. Sallallahu alayk Mawla Hussain Oh my master, my life is entangled in chains Tell me the reason for this pain You are my hope Mawla Hussain Alhamdulillah you are my relief Alhamdulillah, you are my belief. Alhamdulillah, by 
your holy name I will stand all pain and every grief Sallallahu alayk Mawla Hussain Sallallahu Mawla Hussain Yalla louder Sallallahu alayk Mawla Hussain Sallallahu alayk Mawla Hussain Oh my master, my heart beats for your Karbala As Arba'in is my Mawla I yearn for you, O son of Zahra Subhanallah, by the grace of your land Allah has put our cure in your sand Subhanallah by your sacrifice Karbala has become paradise Sallallahu alayk Mawla Hussain Sallallahu alayk Mawla Hussain Oh my master, my heart beats for your Karbala As Arba'in is my Mawla I yearn for you, O son of Zahra Subhanallah, by the grace of your land Allah has put our cure in your sand Subhanallah by your sacrifice Karbala has become paradise Sallallahu Mawla Hussain Sallallahu alayk Mawla Hussain Mawla Hussain Change my destiny like your whore My salvation lies at your door Without you I am lost for sore My hopes are tied with you So me aside You are the only hope to the divine No other path can lead me to the truth And now my only hope has become your shrine Sallallahu alayk Mawla Hussain Sallallahu Sallallahu alayk Mawla Hussain Oh my master, you are the lantern of guidance You are the pride of existence For me you are the lord of patience Allahu Akbar, how could they not see All of your virtues, O oh son of Ali did they not hear what the Prophet has said? I am from him and Hussein is from me. Sallallahu alayhi wa Alaik Mawla Hussain Oh my master My life is entangled in chains Tell me the reason for this pain You are my hope Mawla Hussain Alhamdulillah you are my relief Alhamdulillah you are my belief Alhamdulillah by your holy name I will stand all pain and every grief Sallallahu alayk Mawla Hussain 
Malik, Mola Hossein. Oh, my master, my heart beats for your Karbala. As Arba'in nears my Mola, I yearn for you, O oh son of Zahra. Subhanallah, by the grace of your land, Allah has put our cure in your sand. Subhanallah, by your sacrifice, Karbala has become paradise. Sallallahu alayhi Mawla Hussein Sallallahu alayhi Mawla Hussein Sallallahu alayhi Mawla Mawla Hussein Change my destiny like your whore When salvation lies at your door Without you I am lost for sore My hopes are tied with you so me aside You are the only hope to the divine No other path can lead me to the truth Now my only hope has become your shrine Sallallahu alayhi Mawla Hussain Sallallahu alayhi Mawla Hussain Sallallahu alayhi Mawla Hussain Sallallahu alayk Mawla Hussain Sallallahu alayk Sallallahu alayk Mawla Hussain Sallallahu alayk Mawla Hussain Sallu ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad The second one for the love of Hassan al Hussein with the loudest of your voices. The third for the Ta'jil Faradi Buhur Imam Sahib al Asri was Zaman Bi'ala ala swatikum. لا تسأل عن حال شلوني أين بخيري وانت كبالي رمحك لا يكلك يا ابن أمي هو العالي يريد العالي مرات الدمع ينشاف موقف والدليل بهاي ومن فاطمة يحسين تحفظ دمعتي البيت شاي صارت لك فراتي العين من شفتك بعزة ماي من شفتي الشميس فوقاك صارت بين تبوك في يا ما تنطش ما دام عيوني بيه نشوف ودمعة لاني وين شط ما يصعت للغيمة هو العالي ريد العالي هو العالي ريد العالي 
بس بالاسم مسبية طلعت الفايا ورتك آية كل هي تشوفني العباس بس ما شاء يلي الراية هوديك ما ياك وعين ناقة صحيحي هاي يلي حجاية بس انا سبيكي كله بروس اخوتي مغطاية من حر يا من حر وقفوني بهية خيمت غطي خياني هاي شمياء قاعد كفيهم هاي شمياء قاعد كفيهم هو العالي يريد العالي صعدت على غماح شموس صعدت على رماح يشموس وعرف ما يقصيدكم احساسي هل تريدوني من اشتاق هالكم يرتفع راسي بس ودايعة العباس أبد ما رجفت نفاسي راسي ما يطيخ للقع أنت العريش مقياسي زين بيا صوت اللي يحنيها زين بيا صوت اللي يحنيها وشاف عباس يعيش بباني ها الله اختار الطفل الناس ها الله اختار الطفل الناس هو العالي يريد العالي هو العالي يريد العالي صلوا على محمد وآل محمد گل سرخ بهارانی حسین گل سرخ بهارانی حسین چراغ نیز دارانی حسین به خان قرآن برایم که دوم بالد بیایم به خان قرآن برایم که دوم بالد بیایم حسینم و حسینم حسینم و حسینم حسینم و حسینم حسینم و حسینم گل سرخ بهارانی حسینم گل سرخ بهارانی حسینم چراغ نیز دارانی حسینم به خان قرآن برایم که دوم بالد بیایم حسینم و حسینم 
حسینم و حسینم سرد بالای نک مثل ستاره سرد بالای نک مثل ستاره تند مانند قرآن پار پاره تند مانند قرآن پار پاره صفا بخش دل من چراغ محفل من صفا بخش دل من چراغ محفل من حسینم و حسینم حسینم و حسینم به قربان سر نورانی تو به قربان سر نورانی تو چرا خون ریزد از پیشانی تو به نال نیور دیده زرگ های بریده به نال نور دیده زرگ های بریده حسینم و حسینم حسینم و حسینم حسینم و حسینم حسینم و حسینم گهی در موج خون گه بر سنایی گهی در موج خون گه بر سنایی تو خرشید زمین و آسمانی فرودان ماه زینب چراغ راه زینب فرودان ماه زینب چراغ راه زینب حسینم و حسینم حسینم و به تاب از نو کنه ای ماه زینب به تاب از نو کنه ای ماه زینب که شد کوفه زیارتگاه زینب که شد کوفه زیارتگاه زینب سر راحت نشستم به محفل سر شکستم سر راحت نشستم به محفل سر شکستم حسینم و حسینم حسینم و حسینم نگاهم کن نگاهم کن نگاهم نگاهم کن نگاهم کن نگاهم که من زوار تو در قتل گاهم که من زوار تو در قتل گاهم ازارم لالگون است رخم رنگین ز خون است حسینم و حسینم حسینم و حسینم ما از اتش تو کائنات است حسین آتش به دل آب فرات است حسین لب تشنه لب آب روان جان دادیم با آنکه لبت آب حیات است حسین سبحان الله و الحمد لله و لا اله الا الله و الله اکبر الله اکبر الله اکبر الله اکبر الله اکبر اشهد ان لا اله الا الله اشهد ان لا اله الا الله اشهد ان محمد رسول الله 
أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أشهد أن غمير المؤمنين عليا ولي الله أشهد أن غمير المؤمنين وأولاده المأسومين هجج الله حيا على الصلاح حيا على الصلاح حيا على الفلاح حي على الفلاح حي على خير الأعمال حي على خير الأعمال الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله لا إله إلا الله أجل بالصلاة قبل الفوض أجل بالتوبة قبل الموت